When I first moved to Bethesda, Maryland, I lived in a high rise just upstairs from a Starbucks. And this particular Starbucks had this little secret area in the back corner of the store near the emergency exit door where there was only one table and one chair and complete privacy. And I would work there a lot. I would sit back in that little nook for hours and hours just writing. And one particular night I was there writing late into the evening and I looked up from my laptop only to discover that all of the lights were out in the store and everyone was gone and I didn't even notice. Apparently when they were locking up, no one that worked there saw me back in that little nook and they all just went home. I guess there was no alarm system or they forgot to arm it altogether. And so realizing that I had the place entirely to myself, I just decided to continue to sit there and finish my writing all alone in the dark. And when I finished, I packed up my things and I left through the emergency exit door, making sure to close it securely behind me. You ever have that kind of thing happen to you? You get so deep into your work that you don't even notice your surroundings. This happens to me a lot. I become unaware of everything around me when I'm deep into my work. I become unaware of time and space and mass and matter and temperature and hunger, even my bladder. And as odd of a pairing as it may seem to be, these kinds of experiences from our lives mirror the lesson that we see in our passage for today from the Gospel of John. John 4, 31 through 34, it says this. His disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, if Jesus were alive today, is it possible that he would be working in the back of a bistro doing God's work only to look up and to find that everyone had gone home for the day and that all of the lights were out and that he was all alone? You bet it is. But seriously, there's something important here in this passage because it has to do with one of the most important things in this life. We are in the middle of the season of Lent on the church calendar. The Lenten season is a period of 40 days where many of us choose to give something up that we feel has an unusual hold on us. For many, of the, for many of us, this often has to do with an item of food, maybe a sweet of some kind, maybe red meat, maybe beer, etc. Others of us choose to give up something more, shall we say, temperamental, like anger or impatience or being judgmental. The problem with Lent, though, I believe is that we approach it from the wrong direction altogether. Many people believe that Lent is a season where we give something up so that we might become closer to God. But I don't think that's how it's supposed to work. Rather, I think that Lent is a time where we are to devote ourselves to God so fully that we forget the things that so often and so easily snare us. And there's a very big difference between these two ways of looking at Lent. Because that first way of looking at Lent is all about suppressing something. But the second way of looking at Lent 
is all about allowing something. If you're in a place today where you're able to take notes, feel free to write this down. This is what I would love for you to remember today. Lent is all about purpose. Purpose so all-consuming that we forget the everyday things that so easily distract us. Let me say that again. Lent is all about purpose. Purpose so all-consuming that we forget the everyday things that so easily distract us. And I believe that that is what this passage is trying to get across to us. That is the, the lesson. The disciples are saying something like, Rabbi, we ate hours ago. How are you not hungry yet? For the love of God, eat something. And Jesus says, God's will is my food right now. God's work is my food right now. I'm busy with God's work and I need to finish it. And it begs the question, if Jesus was able to lock in like this, knowing that there was something that God wanted him to do, and that in that present moment, it mattered more than anything else. Are we able to do that too? I think we are. Because Jesus here is talking about purpose. Purpose so all-consuming that we forget the everyday things that so easily distract us. What is your purpose then? I don't know, nor will I ever know. But I can tell you that there is something that you are put on this earth to do. And when you discover it, you know, because it causes you to forget the everyday things that can so easily distract you. For me, purpose feels like a kind of nervous bliss, if you will. I feel it when I'm studying or when I'm writing or when I'm visiting with someone in the hospital who is very sick. Is it work? Yes. Does it take energy? Absolutely. Does it take time? Sure. Does it take focus? Yes. But underneath all of it, there is a kind of grace there. A grace to be able to do everything that purpose demands of me. Our purpose is that for which we always have energy and ideas. That which we wake up thinking about in the morning and that which we go to sleep thinking about at night. And our purpose doesn't have to be something earth shattering like splicing a gene or fostering world peace. It can be something as simple as being a good parent or showing up to the same job for 30 years on time, being faithful, giving it our best, and coming home at the end of the day and cutting the grass. We humans like to make distinctions when it comes to purpose because of ego. We like to believe that one person's life matters more than another person's life. But God doesn't make those kinds of distinctions. God sees us all as we are, as people who each have a purpose. I love how Viktor Frankl spoke about life and purpose. He once wrote this, Don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you are going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue. 
and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than one's self. Life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. What is it in your life that has meaning to you? Don't apologize for it. Lean into it fully. Do it with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Your life matters. You have a purpose. You might not think so, but this world needs you. Not some version of you imitating someone else's purpose. No, this world needs you. Uniquely you. And discovering this is one of life's greatest adventures. His disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So go out into your life this week. Doing the will of God, finishing the work that God has for your life. No matter how big or small someone tells you that it is, just be faithful with what God has entrusted to you. The good work that you have to do in this world. I want to ask you to spend a few moments now getting still, getting quiet, and reflecting on this lesson from today. Thinking about your life, your purpose, the things that you find deep meaning in working at and accomplishing. I also want to invite you at this time, if you wish, to receive communion, the Eucharist with us. If you don't happen to have unleavened bread and wine in your proximity, whatever you have available is sufficient. But let's spend a few moments now as we get still and quiet, allowing God to shape this lesson into our hearts. Let's spend a few moments now meditating on that. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to CIB Just For Kids. My name is Lauren. Today I have a lesson to share with you and as always I'd like for us to start off with our silent moment. This is a moment for you to breathe deeply and to ground yourself, center yourself, and just really be in touch with your body and try to quiet your mind. So let's find a quiet place to sit and uh, make sure that your head is over your heart and your heart is over your hips. And feel free to close your eyes if you like. Okay, thank you for sharing that with me. And now I have a story to share with you. This one's called, What If the Zebras Lost Their Stripes? What if the zebras lost their stripes? And some lost black, and some lost white. Would they think that it's all right? Or would the zebras start to fight? Would there be separate zebra types if the zebras lost their stripes? Would different colors be the end of living life as loving friends? Would zebras see themselves as zebras? Or would their colors make them start to only see the black or white and not what lives within their hearts? Would there be separate zebra lands? Could black and white friends still hold hands? Would zebra children be okay to join together laugh and play. I know why God gave zebra stripes, so that there'd be no black or white. But zebras would be much too smart to let their colors tear them apart. The end, and I love this picture at the end here. So, I hope that the story brings you a sense of hope. Um, I have a little activity for you that includes, it's a coloring sheet. It just says, kindness begins with me. So I hope that you enjoy this activity. I hope that the lesson brings you a sense of hope and uh, appreciation for all your friends in your life. Um, and uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.